father takes the mercenaries to the bunkhouse, which is actually Fat Boy. Yep. And he sets them all up in there for the night. And then he wakes Charlie up in the middle of the night and tells him that he needs his help. And he gets Charlie to climb up on top of the of Fat Boy while the mercenaries are sleeping. And Fat Boy's several stories yes. high. It's a yeah. high it's climb. It's terrifying. And Charlie's got to be silent as he yep. does it so he doesn't wake them. And he's got to close the sort of trap door yep. that's on the top of Fat Boy, which vents it. And so he closes that and locks it with like a stick. And then Harrison Ford locks the door to Fat Boy on the ground and he turns on Fat Boy, which will freeze the mercenaries to death inside the building. Yeah, within minutes. Within minutes. Charlie realizes at this point what's going on, that his father is intending to kill these men. And his father's like, don't feel sorry for those men. At that point, I think he gets bitten by a mosquito. And he's like, don't feel sorry for this bug. Or something. Right. It's it's something that causes him to bleed. But, you know, Charlie is just horrified as to what's happening. So Fat Boy fires up and it starts to freeze them. And father's like, if they just lie down on the ground, it'll all be over quickly. And at that point, the rest of the family is woken up because when you turn Fat Boy on, it's loud. And then now these mercenaries are screaming inside the thing. Mr. Hattie's like, who's making ice? Yeah, I mean, it's a why whole, are you making ice at this hour? It's a whole scene. It is. And the mercenaries who have uh, like machine guns yes. start firing in Fat Boy, which... Is just n- no good. Yeah, because Fat Boy <laughs> is filled with flammable pipes and whatnot. And like some sort of flammable um, liquid or something yes. too. Chemicals. A chemicals, yes. Probably like, I, I have no idea because I don't know these he things. Said what but it like, was. It's he like, did, but I, I'm thinking it's like some sort of like coolant or freon or something like right, that. Right. Yeah. Some hazardous chemical yes. liquid. And they start firing at the doors and at the pipes, and it basically makes it explode in a huge explosion that not only blows up Fat Boy, and it's the explosion is impressive. Like yeah. it seems to go on and on forever. But it also the fire travels through all these tubes, tubes. that they made mm-hmm. the, throughout the village. So the entire village blows up and yep. thankfully nobody's there anymore except for the family yep. and Mr. Hattie and it kills the mercenaries obviously and also all the chemical from inside the uh fat boy runs into the river so and Mr. Hattie's boat sinks and Mr. Hattie's boat sinks <laughs> so it destroys everything and basically salts the earth so that they couldn't even rebuild here. Right. They can't even live in this part of the river anymore because the water's been poisoned. Yep. It's a complete fucking disaster. All because father needed to bring ice to, to the, the, the natives. To the savages. savages. The savages. Yes. So, yeah. He's, I have so much resentment for father. Yeah. At this point, you're completely no longer, you know, for a second, I was kind of won over. Yeah. That part of me that would like to live in some sort of utopia is seeing this thing they built and thinking, wow, that might actually be kind of nice. Oh, yeah. No, I'm right there with you the whole way. I'm right there with you until this ridiculousness happens and this whole everything just goes to complete shit. It so didn't have to happen. And at this point, there's basically no return from hell at this point (laughs) because they get in this tiny little boat that they have left and they travel upriver because father's got in his head that that's where life really is, is upriver. They could go downriver back to Mr. Hattie's town or whatever. They do first. That's how they end up at the ocean. Right. Well, they traveled through down the river to the ocean. Yes. And at that point, the family's like, we're going to go home. They yes. think they're all going to go yes. home now because it's and all And Mr. Hattie's like, Pan- Panama's right over here. Like, UK yeah. America's here. Like, it didn't work out. Right. You know, like, we're, let's go back home. Right. You, you know, everybody thinks at this point, okay, well, that was, we screwed up. So now we're going back home. The experiment failed. But father is undeterred. They're on this crummy beach that's got all this garbage washed washed up up on it and he's like we've got everything we need right here and i remember this part very much from when i would see it when i was younger and just feeling like oh god just go home and well and then he tells the big lie to his family which 
the only person who is a hundred percent not buying it is is mother. I mean, she knows, but she's yeah. so like just standing by her man. She becomes a little frustrating at this point. She certainly does. You know, because she's the other adult in the room right. who's like just totally co-signing his bullshit. Yeah. But you know, and the kid and and Charlie kind of is skeptical of this too. But the other kids don't know. You know, and yeah. he tells them that because he keeps talking about in many of his rants about how nuclear war is coming. Right. And so he tells them that there is no America anymore, that it burned down. There yep. was a war and there's no home to go back to. Right. And at this point in the 80s, that would have been a, a real, really easy a real threat. That would have been an easy lie to sell to people. Absolutely. Because we were all thought that was going to basically happen. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, that would be easy to convince the kids um, that the world no longer existed. So that's what he tells them. They go along with it. Mr. Hattie. It's like, well, I'm going back to Panama or whatever. So he leaves. Well, but father gives Mr. Hattie his Omega watch right. first. And he's like, gift. as a gift, you know, and, and mother's like, you've been so good to us. Plus, like, you know, his boat was ruined and, right. you know, like they feel bad about it. Right. So that's the last kind of possession, I guess, that father has. Right. And his father's doing it because he's like, I don't need a watch anymore. Yeah. You know, he's just going to live by the sun uh, or whatever. So yeah. it's serving two things to give Mr. Hattie something for all of his losses. And because they're throwing off the shackles of all society or whatever. But the family really, even at this point, wants to go with Mr. Hattie. They're like, you know, they they would be fine with going if they're not if the if the US is gone, yeah. let's go to Panama then. Yeah. But no. So they build the like habitat sort mm -hmm. of thing there and f at first it looks okay, like it's kind of, you know, well, they've got he sets up some pulleys and stuff mm -hmm. to make like a turbine and you know he you know but he's not going to use chemicals anymore because mm -hmm. that was the mistake that he mm -hmm. that was of before was that he had relied on chemicals and now they're just going to use wind turbines and stuff that he makes out of pulleys and whatever so he's still employing his genius and they build like a structure to live in and they've got some stuff going and he's got this um, motor boat motor mm -hmm. that he needs to he needs spark plugs, spark plugs for the motor yeah but it's kind of unclear what's going on, but it looks like they've built their whole habitat on a sort of a boat. boat, like a yeah. raft type of thing. So uh, Mr. Hattie comes back to visit and just check in on them. And, and he's bring like, some stuff. And bring some stuff, but father's too proud to accept any of the stuff that he wants. He's like, I don't need any of your stuff here. Your he, charity. Your charity. And Mr. Hattie's like... You've built too close to the water and the rainy season's going to come and you're going to get the washed away. Gonna, yeah, it's going to come all the way up. But like at this point, father's not listening to him nope. or anybody basically and t t tells him to fuck off more or less. The next scene, we see that the rain has begun and it's nighttime and they're all in their sort of tent habitat and the miserable. rain's pouring Just down. Just miserable. And mother and father are asleep and Mr. Hattie sneaks up to River Phoenix and is like, here, I've got some spark plugs. And here's some gas. And here's some gas. You're going to need it. And he's like, and God be with yeah, you. Yeah, God bless. God be yeah. with you. And sure enough, the floods come and they are washed out into the river on this, you know. Ramshackle ra ram raft. Ramshackle raft that they're living on. Yeah. It's bad. It's, it's really bad. It's a bad scene. Everyone's pretty much over it. Well, and Charlie at this point, too, like in the middle of like the storm, he's like, Dad, I found these, you yeah. know, and they're the spark plugs and then the gas or whatever. And so they get the motor going and like mother and everyone's like, yay, let's go to Panama. Let's go to Mr. Hattie's. Yeah. And father's like, no, we're, we've got a motor. We're going upstream. Right. And you're just like, oh, no. Yeah. Your heart just, just sinks. sinks. Sinks further. It just keeps sink. It's the, the forever sinking heart. Yes. So they are now going upriver and they've got no food. They look all haggard and like shit. So sunburned too. Like it just, this ramshackled raft that they've created has zero shelter. Yeah. So they're just like having to put like these rags like on their heads and stuff. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, they look miserable. Right. The twins are basically non-functional and just <laughs> sleeping under a tarp or whatever. And something happens with um I was at the I, I don't know boat terminology is it the rudder? Yeah. Is that the mo something 
the propeller. Propeller. Yeah, it's the propeller. Something happens with that. And so they the, the boys are up at the front of the boat with these giant poles that they're like kind of navigating along the river. Yes. And father's at the back. And then he's like, you at know, the motor. Yes, at the motor. And then he's got to like because something happens with the motor. He's the propeller go. falls off. So he's got to go dive into yes. the river to get the propeller. Yes. And he goes and dives into the river. He has this rope tied around his ankle and he dives in and they're waiting and they're waiting. And then the rope comes up and he's not on the end of the rope. No. And it's a long time. Right. It's a long time. And and then mother freaks out. She's like, I can't take it anymore. I can't take any more of this. And the boys are like, let's go. Let's go. Let's go now. Let's go to to Mr. Mr. Hattie's. And And like basically like he's dead. Let's go. Yeah. And then father pops up out of the water. Right. With the propeller. With the propeller. Pissed. Yeah. And he's like, traitors. Traitors. Yeah. Yeah. I remembered. I remembered that too. And then that's when he makes uh, Charlie and Jerry like be towed behind in this like sad canoe or something that like they're, it's a punishment boat that they're having to ride in, which is even worse than being in this ramshackle raft and they're just like roasting in the sun. And this is when like Jerry's like, I want to kill him. Yeah. We could do it really easily. We could just sneak up and behind him and stab him with a knife. And we hear in the voiceover narration that Charlie's thinking about it too. Oh yeah. He's like, it would be easy. easy. But then Charlie's like, to Jerry is like, no, don't even say that. And Jerry's like, you were thinking it too. Yeah, which he and was. Char- which he was, because we heard it. And yeah. then Charlie's like, no, I wasn't thinking it. Yes, you uh, were, Charlie. So then what happens is they're going along upriver and they hear this heavenly <laughs> singing. Like the twins, one of the twins is like, are those <laughs> angels? <laughs> she's like, so She looks like she's close to death. Yeah. <laughs> Probably from starvation. Like, they're like cooking like rats or something oh, on or yeah. some kind of just gr- gross. No, and that's like, isn't this the point where Harrison Ford's like, don't have too much coconut. Yeah. You know, we need to ration. And he like smiles when he's like, don't know when we'll eat next. Mm-hmm. And he's like, like he's like, he's like, it's a fun adventure. Like, right. we don't know when we'll eat next. Yeah. And I just thought like, I want to punch you right in the face. Right. It is probably... <laughs> Certainly to to this point in history, but it is probably Harrison Ford's least sympathetic role, maybe ever, because at this point, you fucking hate him, like hate him. I mean, I think his performance is great. Oh, yeah. I mean, and he's, you know, his hair's getting all raggedy and just the charm of him is just gone and what's left is just this person who's all ego and so consumed yes just consumed and driven he's just such a self-will run riot he just is like running on like yes ego and i am going to make this righteousness i'm gonna fit this circle into a square i'm gonna make it work you know like and it's just like dude it's not working yeah yeah, if, if I think about Jack Nicholson in this role, I just think of him doing Jack Torrance. Like, so I'm glad that it was Harrison Ford oh, yeah. because I think that Harrison Ford is more believable as sort of an everyman and a person that could convince people to follow him. You Absolutely, know? no, and I think he is. I think he's perfect in this role. I think he's great. I think it's he's, one of his best roles, to be honest. But it's so. Not like his other roles where he's just, I mean, he's, you know, Han Solo, he's Indiana Jones. Yeah. He's just this, this super charming guy. And... Which is why I think this movie failed. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it's like the the charisma that he usually brings to his leading man roles is now turned on itself in a really kind of interesting way that makes you fucking hate him. Because yes. he's just, because he is Harrison Ford and good looking and sort of like oh and confident confident and, and, and like all of those things now are like turning him into yes. a monster so well it's like with that thing when you fall for someone and all these things you thought were really like right. endearing like turn out to be the things that well, are people who are really passionate and these charismatic passionate type of leaders can become monsters well, you know it happens in cults every time right, right it's the same it's a very cult leader ish type of yes charisma so yeah i mean i i think that 
his performance is actually pretty great. I think he's, I think it's one of his, like I said, I think yeah. it's one of his best. It's not one of his most likable. No, it's his least <laughs> likable it's, it's part, like, probably. Well, there's another one that's just so, not so likable. Right. But, I, he, he, but he, as a young man yeah. or young-ish man, this was his most unlikable yes, role. Yes. I mean, he went on to play grumpy characters in movies as an older man. But like at this point, he was in his like height of his matinee yes. hero image. So. Yes. It's really a departure. Anyway, so they hear this heavenly, heavenly choir, choir and they arrive at a missionary village, which has been set up by the Andre Gregory character. Yes. The funny part is that so they arrive on the banks of this village and nobody's greeting them because they're all in this nice white chapel that's been built well and we get to have the kids that are all like oh they have a basketball like yeah. court or whatever and like oh do you see these toys they live in real houses like you're getting all this like chatter as they're like you know as they're all walking as sneaking a group throughout sneaking the through village. the village that is completely deserted because like you said they're right. all in church and at this point they look like feral creatures yeah. like they must just smell so bad yeah. <laughs> like river phoenix's hair is all sticking up and crazy yeah, everybody Everybody's got wild hair. Yeah. But nobody's out and they're all gathered in this church. So they, they go sneak in and peek in, in the church. And they're all the most of the people that were living with them and their what was it? Geronimo. Geronimo when things were going good are now there in the pews. And they're not witnessing a live sermon, nope. but they're watching a giant television that's got Andre Gregory's character i don't know if they're watching a broadcast from the states or if they're watching a vhs tape i don't know but, but they're watching a sermon that's been televised and it's so terrible it's like it's awful. it's such like um evangelistic yes. type televangelistic yes. that you would see there's like a whole thing where he's like you just gotta if you want to talk to god you know you gotta pray and it's just like making a phone call and so then he like rolls out this rotary phone and is like going through the motions of making the phone call and what do you do if the line is cut yeah. you dial them again and right. it's just like so sad and all these you know these native folks are here and they're just like and dressed up really nice at this church service, uh, it's the worst. Yeah, as if they've gone to like Sunday Yeah, church. like with a real service. Yeah. It's just so gross. So then but they, they all go back to the boat and they go to sleep. I think, I mean, I think it's, you know, it gets to be dark. Yeah, like it sun, gets to be dark and they just go back to the boat to sleep. But the boys yes. sneak away from the boat and they... Go they hear the, a truck arrive or something. Yeah, and they they hear voices and they follow that, and it's the main. They they follow it to like I think the main house on yeah. the property, which is the missionary's house, the Andre Gregory and his family. Yeah. So they're like sitting around, you know, watching TV and eating or whatever, and cute Martha Plimpton's there and with her headphones on, and she looks out the window and there's these feral <laughs> creatures. Yeah. Poor Charlie and Jerry, like, just looking worse for the wear. But they, like, you know, flag him down. And, yeah. and so she comes outside and she's just like, what happened to you? Yeah. You know, like, you guys look terrible. Well, like, I think uh, Charlie's like, so where did you go or whatever? And she's like, oh, we went back to Baltimore. And, and she's like, it sucks. It or it's sucks. terrible or whatever. And then Jerry's like, is, you know, is America gone or yeah. something like that? And she's like, what? She's yeah. it's just completely. She's like, what are you talking about? And then Jerry's like, our father told us that America had been destroyed. And she's like, I thought my father yeah. said weird things or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically they learn, which River Phoenix, I think, knew no, all along. But... but Jerry learns definitively that the world has not been destroyed yeah. and Dad's been lying to them mm -hmm. this whole time, but they ask for her help. And so the next thing we see is they return to the raft. Mother's there and she's woken up because she's gone to look for father who has mysteriously disappeared. Mm -hmm. And Charlie and Jerry reveal that uh, Martha Plimpton has given them the keys to the truck and they can get away, yep. but they're going to leave father behind. Yep. But mother doesn't want to leave father behind. Nope. And this, I'm just at this, this point, I'm really frustrated with her. No, this and is it like, sucks because I really love Helen Mirren, but her character is frustrating in this. Well, and this I think is, people watching this now would struggle with this because she's such a doormat and just she, goes along with it. And it's it like, is the come worst on. codependency yeah. ever. Like you see it and you're just like, 
oh my God. It's, yeah, it's just so super frustrating. The next thing that happens though, actually makes her change her mind is because all of a sudden they hear, look over and they see this church is on fire. Yep. Because father has snuck off with a gas tank and he really hates the preacher yep. and his missionary. So he's decided to burn down the yep. church. So now he's basically just turned into an evil vandal murderer. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not even self-defense anymore. No. It's like straight up aggression. Revenge and yeah. Yes. So he, th at that point, that's when we get Helen Mirren. That finally. She's like, she's finally, like, mother's yeah. like, okay, let's go. And so then they're ready to go. And then again, he's just like shows up. I mean, they all know he's done it, but then yeah. he like literally shows up with the like, gas can. I got can. some gas. Yeah. <laughs> It's just like this crazed face. And yeah. um, they're like, we're going, yeah. you know, later or whatever. And then Andre Gregory comes out with a gun and she, like shoots over in the direction of where he can hear them. And, yes. you know, he goes, he keeps calling him the whole time the communists. Right. Right. So he's like, it's the communist. And so he like nails father. In the neck, basically. Yeah. Like near the shoulder the collarbone up yeah. there. Yeah. So now... They all get back on the fucking boat. Yeah, that was also frustrating. <laughs> I, I was like, why just go? Just leave just him. Go. Who leave cares? Him. Or fine, if you want to take him, like, go get the Jeep or something. I don't know. There's got to be a better way. Yeah, they just wanted to sort Yeah, I know. Of, they got to get back on that boat. They wanted to give it a dramatic ending. Yes. I mean, the story is over at this point. They get back on the boat and they go floating upriver, but father who is now basically on his back and dying and paralyzed they're he not can't... going up river they're going they're, they they want to go down river. right right yeah. i'm sorry they're they're going down river back to the ocean right but father's like are we going up river and they're he just basically has his last moment with charlie where he, he, he says, does his thing where he's like how am i doing son right and he's like you're doing fine dad and then like he's you know waxing poetic about whatever this and that about yeah. life and basically he's like the human experiment is yeah. a failure yeah he talks about how human beings are failures because we're not built correctly to right. we should have, live. We, we should, should have be tails and, and covered in fur. Right. And... We should be walking on all fours and we should have teeth that yeah. can tear things. Like we're imperfect because we evolved. I have one more bit of trivia for you that applies to the ending that I've been saving. All right. Well, I'll whip it out. The book has a, a different ending. Mm -hmm. They so, all go to McDonald's. <laughs> I mean, it's the, the same, but it's a lot more gruesome. Uh-huh. So after he finally collapses, then he is eaten by vultures. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Creatures that I guess he despises throughout the book, okay. which is a reoccurring theme. So, you know, of course, poetic justice right. that he gets Vult eaten by the vultures. Right. Because he sort of sees society as being vulturistic. Being can yeah. yeah like cannibalistic or whatever. Parasitical. Parasitical. That's yes. better. Yes. So in the movie, he just slowly dies from his gunshot wounds. Yes. But. Yeah, in the book, it says Ali Fox, whose father, finally collapses, after which he is eaten by vultures. So, yeah, that would have been kind of nice little touch. I can see why they yeah, didn't go that way. It wasn't, they weren't ready. No. And it just ends with some voiceover from Charlie saying that now that his father was gone, he could learn to love him again. Right. And we see their raft reaching the, the mouth to the ocean, and we know that they're going to go home and live their lives without this horrible man <laughs> and that's the end and you know it's if father and he wouldn't be father then he just would have been ally fox mm -hmm. wanted to have this life by all means like live your best life alone but don't right. like drag your poor wife and kids into all of this like right. they especially the kids the kids have zero say yeah and this and it's just like they just wanted to be playing atari and some air conditioning yep and having some now and laters and <laughs> i think <laughs> I this movie weirdly formed some opinions that i had about this kind of like rejection of society i think this served as a cautionary tale if I ever sort of would go too far down mm -hmm. that road in my mind. It's funny, we recently watched uh, Captain Fantastic, which I think approaches a lot of these same ideas, but in a much kinder, a like, much kinder sympathetic way. way. Like this is presenting the sort of like hellish version and Captain Fantastic is presenting the, there's things wrong with this, but 
he's a decent human being in the end and he does the right thing in the end and you know what i mean well like, and there's so much love like right. there's never a doubt that uh vigo morgeson's character like he loves, his, loves kids. his kids and those kids know they're loved yeah like he's not you know and they they actually love their life yeah like with him like no one except i mean there's one of the kids of course one that's of kids is, like yeah. kind of like i want to go live with my grandparents there's whatever. conflict but, and stuff yeah but, but it's not it's it's just i mean father in in this harrison ford's character is a dick <laughs> the Vigo Mortensen's character in that, I mean, he does make them like mountain climb and he puts them in danger. He does put and, them in danger, he, but he's they're hard on them. But they're here for it. Right. Like, no, it's not that he's not putting them in danger, but the the kids are, except with the exception of one of in that film, are all pretty gung ho for yeah. it. These kids are pretty much on board too, but like he definitely is, as he's, you know, dissenting further into his egotistical madness, is not dishing out the love no. anymore to them and he's actually quite cruel yes captain fantastic is is a kinder softer version of much being kinder, off much the grid softer, yes. yeah but interesting companion pieces yes so um revisiting this how did you feel about it i actually really enjoyed watching it i yeah. mean I, you know i don't know if and when i need to watch it again anytime soon i'm not like oh no, i need to definitely not I need to go watch the mosquito coast again but i i really enjoyed this watch yeah. um i think it's really well acted mm -hmm. uh, i think the casting is great i think the locations are incredible i love the locations they actually the village in geronimo three separate sets for oh that. wow so i mean just crazy amounts of money was put into yep. this being in the location but also just the amount of detail and everything oh yeah the production the looks the production amazing is it's incredible yeah i agree with some of you know what father's saying of course of course yeah um as i did when you know with captain fantastic too i was like yeah i get this but yeah, like especially in these days when we're really seeing the detriments of capitalism i mean the beginning of the movie he's really talking about how capitalism has fucked everything up and it's so funny because it's coming from the 80s and right. it's like oh dude you, you don't, don't even, even know, know. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna get so much worse than it is here yes in the 1986 yeah. it's gonna be so much more terrible yeah. in 2021 just but yeah. um so yeah i mean you know looking at it from that point of view if you like us are not the hugest fan of late stage, stage capitalism him, that's going to resonate with you and you're going to relate to his character to a certain point <laughs> to a certain point yeah is exactly what it is it's to a certain point right and again going back to he had it they, they were just so frustrating they had it they had it pretty good like yeah. they could have they could have really like rode that out with the ice yep. and you know been there and just just it was just not enough yeah there was always like there's in and, and that you know that's a reoccurring theme and so many different well yeah areas. i mean and human i think i think a, a theme of the movie is that human beings are inherently never satisfied, satisfied with things like he gets what he wants and he can't just leave it alone he's got to keep trying for something more grand well, and that blows up in his face literally it does literally blow up in his face and the irony is is that's one of his criticisms of america right. and the people living there is that you know it's never enough yeah like you know you're you're you eat when you're not hungry yep. you know you buy things you don't need and all mm -hmm. of this stuff and it's like yeah dude but you also weren't satisfied like you yep. actually got this big machine that you had dreamed about creating working you're serving ice to these people who had never seen ice before for free and everyone's jazzed but no you gotta go one, we step, gotta go further. one step further and the, it's the ultimate mess <laughs> yeah i also really enjoyed this rewatch you know obviously when i saw it originally i was not a, aware of the director and his work yeah, no. and now i can really see peter weir's Absolutely. hand in it and it just cements my feelings that mm -hmm. he's a great director and somebody who I'm always up for watching one of his movies. I think he just has an understanding of the human condition in a lot of ways. A lot of his movies deal with sort of these, you know, people going against the elements. And it's not always the same thing like Master and Commander deals with some of these themes, but in a much different way more positive way so he's not a cynical director interestingly we forgot to mention this this was written by paul schrader i was just gonna say that i yeah. was like that again like what you were just talking about mm -hmm. 
uh, is what Paul Schrader does too, right. like with Taxi Driver, Raging Bull. Right. Like, I mean, it's it's a similar. Not to read too much into it, but I might say that maybe the cynicism is coming more from Paul Schrader, <laughs> possibly, because <laughs> he's kind of a cynical guy. I feel like maybe the cynicism is coming from Paul Schrader's script, but who knows? I don't know. I mean, I I would kind of. I don't know. I kind of want to check out the book just to see as a comparison. I mean, I'm, sure I'm sure the sure book's it's a... pretty cynical, but yeah, who knows? But I think, you know, and that was another thing I believe in the trivia too, that, you know, it was a pretty true adaptation of, of the book, except mm-hmm. that they didn't get to go into as much detail, obviously, right. because it's a two hour film, which is probably what, like you said earlier, what they're doing with the series. Yeah. Do you have any interest in watching the series after seeing this? Or Kind of, because I like Justin Thoreau. Yeah, might be interesting to check I, out. I would check it out. I haven't heard anything good or bad, so I don't know. Yeah, I could go, go back to the Mosquito Coast and get frustrated with Justin Thoreau. Yeah, why not? <laughs> um, I think it's obvious why it didn't do so well. I think uh, probably yeah. it's people thought that, you know, there was going to be a fun Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones style jungle adventure, and they got this <laughs> descent into misery I, I i just wish i could remember like <laughs> what what the conversations were after going to see this in the theater i mean i just went you know i mean i've always gone to the movies a lot and so i'm sure this was just me going with my friend or my mom or you know moms and friends or something to to see this film mm-hmm. and i just i'm sure <laughs> like nobody all <laughs> left really bummed out <laughs> oh, i just i wish i could remember I wish I could remember how that was afterwards. I'm sure it was quite depressing. <laughs> this isn't like Indiana Jones at all. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to go uh, get in my boat and take it up river and build myself a fat boy and bring some native some ice. Annie and I are going to stay right here. <laughs> That about does it today for Tentpole Trauma. If you like what you heard, check out our social media presence on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Just look for Tentpole Trauma. That was easy, wasn't it? If you like us, hit subscribe and leave us a sterling review on iTunes, if you dare. If you really like us, head over to Patreon.com and get involved in one of our fabulous tiers. You'll be glad you did. Want to communicate with Tentpole Trauma? Send an email to tentpoletrauma at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. And who knows, one day you may even get your email read on one of our shows. Well, thanks for listening, and we'll see you real soon. (laughs) 